Hi all, a very good evening, and thank you so much for joining us today with us. I would like to thank Doc Norton for joining us today, and let's get started. So we'll start with a small introduction about the innovation routes, then we'll talk about the logistics required for the webinar. Then I'll give you a, a, sm a small introduction about the Doc Norton. Then I'll hand over a, a talk to Doc Norton on Agile metrics. Then we'll have a, a Q&A session. So introduction about the innovation routes. So we are the skill transfer journeyman and trusted consulting provider of strategic methodology and technology advisory and solution to enterprise building largest and innovative solution. So we do provide agile consulting and coaching. We provide agile training in-house and public. So we are the CA Tech continuous delivery suite officer resellers. So the logistics, I would request you to please use a LAN cable for joining this webinar. Wi-Fi connection are unstable. Use high quality speakers or headphone for better sound quality. Uh, request you to please keep your microphone muted. If you have any questions, please drop your all question in Q&A chat box. The webinar will be recorded and the slide recording will be made available on slide set. So here's the URL. You can go through the slide set.net slash Inoru. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Innovation Roots. I would, I would appreciate your cooperation. So speaker introduction, Doc Norton. Doc Norton is a founder and CEO at CTO2. He is a software delivery professional working to make the world of software development a better place. His experience covers a wide range of development talking. A frequent and well-rated international speaker, passionate about helping others to become better developers, working with teams to improve delivery and building great organization. So over to Doc. Great, thanks. Um, so I think I'm violating most of the rules in terms of, uh, I'm unfortunately on Wi-Fi, uh, but it's the best that I could do uh, given where I am right now. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, uh, if there are questions or responses to my questions, please drop them in the Q&A chat and we will, we will get those through. Uh, I am going to be asking some questions as I go through this talk. Uh, it is on uh, Agile Metrics. Uh, the talk title is actually Escape Velocity, which happens to be the also the title of my book, which is on this exact same topic. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that I was going to be asking some questions. My first question to you is, what's velocity? When you think about velocity, what comes to mind for you? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Doc. Can you please share your screen? I thought I had. I thought you had, actually. My bad. So go back one slide there. That's the intro. Okay. And then the question to the group is, what's velocity? So again, when you think about velocity, what comes to mind for you? And I'm not able to see the chat window, so if you if you can uh, read them to me, that'd be great. Sure. So it's speed. It's a speed. Speed. Yep, that's a common one. Yeah. So Steven has dropped the answer. So velocity velocity is the number of story points completed completed last iteration. Okay, number of story points per iteration. That is also a very common uh, definition of velocity. I think both of those are. I think those are, are are correct. I think the second one is probably a little more precise for our context. Um, the first one, interestingly enough, uh, is I think one of the challenges with velocity. So if we think about it, uh, velocity is is you know basically work units over time. It is uh, whether it's story points or ideal days or uh, you know, person hours or however you quantify your work over some known period of time, be that if you call it a sprint or an iteration, if it's a month, three weeks, two weeks, one week, whatever, 
you take that unit of work, you divide it by that unit of time, and what you actually get then is speed. Velocity is a vector. It is, it has to have a direction. Uh, so when I think about velocity, I think about work units over time towards the delivery of value to a customer. Uh, and with that thought in mind, I've even made the argument that if you are not delivering to a customer in a given iteration, if it doesn't go into production and someone is using it and finding it valuable, I would argue then you have not actually achieved any velocity. Uh, and I realize that in many organizations, in many environments, that's a really difficult concept. Uh, but I think it would help us a lot if we think about velocity and we think about what the actual objective is and we measure our success towards that objective. Uh, it's not about how much work are we getting done. Actually, it's about how much value are we delivering. Uh, but there's other dimensions to velocity, other things that I think it's important for us to think about that we don't tend to. And one of those is that velocity is, in fact, a lagging indicator. Now, I'm showing a picture here of an unemployment line in the United States many, many years ago. Uh, and the reason I'm showing unemployment is it turns out that unemployment is also a lagging indicator. It is a lagging indicator of a declining economy. Now, here's the thing about lagging indicators. They tell us what happened. They tell us about the past. But they're actually not good short-term predictors for the future. We can look at a history of lagging indicators and we can start to see patterns across a long history horizon. And we can use that to forecast uh, in broad strokes in the future. So for example, if we looked at three years of velocity data, we might start to see, uh, hey, it turns out that the velocity goes down every year around the same time, which happens to coordinate with our holiday season. So I see. we I can. Sorry to interrupt. The slides are not moving. I hope. Beg your pardon. Um, the slides are not moving. We are still in the first slide only. So I should be on a lagging indicator slide that shows uh, uh, unemployment. See if this helps. Any update to the slides? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, right. So they're not good for short-term predictions. They're good for longer-term predict for long longer-term uh, indications, right? Um, and another thing, when we look at, at unemployment and why this is important for for uh, and liking indicators in general, if you have high unemployment in uh, any given uh, you know, country, ecosystem, society, whatever. Uh, we've learned over time through various uh, economic uh, attempts at a number of different things that the way that you actually solve unemployment is you look at how do you adjust the economy. So we do things like we control uh, inflation, we control the flow of money into a particular, uh, you know, in, in, into the economy itself. Um, we might do some things with taxes, we might do some things with interest rates, but you'll notice that almost none of those directly create jobs. We've found that jobs programs don't actually solve long-term unemployment issues. They may create temporary spikes, but they don't actually solve the long-term issues. So a lagging indicator, when you want to correct it, you have to actually get to the root cause. You have to get to what that indicator is telling you, adjust or correct that thing, and then the lagging indicator uh, will you know, correct on its own. So the last thing I think about is, uh, when I look at, at uh, velocity, is that, so you know, it's working units over time, that's great. It's a lagging indicator. Okay, that's interesting uh, and can be informative about maybe we shouldn't be using velocity for predictions. But then velocity is also the measure of a complex system. So it tells us about uh, the results, uh, sort of. 
but nothing about the process by which that result was actually achieved. So if we look at, you know, here's a, a if you can, hopefully the slide has advanced. Um, I'm looking at a, a fairly typical kind of cartoon drawing of, uh, I'm going to call it a scrum process, but it's it's pretty much an, a, you know, generic uh, agile process. And you can see that we've got numerous artifacts, product backlog, a sprint backlog. Uh, we've got some kind of documentation. We've got, we've got some testing. Uh, we've got a bunch of different uh, processes. So we've got planning and we've got daily standups. And of course, we've actually got development and number of people involved. You've got the team, you've got the product owner, uh, hopefully you've got the end customer, et cetera. So you've got all of these different factors that are involved in this system. And basically an idea comes through, goes through all of these steps and stages, is reviewed or seen or touched or something by all of these different people. And at the end of an iteration, some number pops out and we say, that's our velocity. Uh, so it's a measure of a complex system, which I found that really interesting. And I want to think about, I want you to, to think about this a bit. What else do we know of that meets all of these criteria that maybe by analogy, we can take a different look at velocity. So one of the things that I thought of that meets all of these criteria in terms of uh, wow. it is a, lag, a lagging indicator and a measure of a complex system is your body weight. Your body weight is a lagging indicator for a complex system, right? You have inputs, you've got outputs, um, you have different activities that you engage in uh, or, or choose to not engage in. And uh, as a result of all of those various activities and interactions, your body has some measure of, of weight, which is a lagging indicator of the things that you did previously. It is a, you know, a, an end result, right? So I want you to think about what are the things that affect your body weight? And uh, give me a couple of answers if you can. So what are things that might affect your body weight? We getting any answers? Yes. Tide control, gravity. <laughs> gravity, quality love it. Quality, quantity and quality of food, lifestyles, exercise, nutrition, age. Absolutely. These are all really good, right? Diet, exercise, I think genetics were mentioned, obviously physical health, mental health, uh, exercise, your, uh, the environment that you work in, the, uh, the work that you do, the stress levels that you have, uh, your own social network. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, the people that we hang out with, uh, whether that be online uh, and interact with frequently or in actual, you know, real, like meeting people face to face, uh, I know that sounds crazy. Who does that these days? Um, that social network has a significant mm -hmm. impact on, on your body weight. Uh, if the people that you tend to hang around with are uh, heavier, you have a like 80% chance of actually gaining weight just because you're hanging out with them. Uh, and if you make the decision to hang out with people who are uh, thinner, you've got an 80% chance of actually losing weight. Um, so the other thing about body weight is if you think about all the people that you know and the health, their actual health, and then their actual physical presentation, how they look, it turns out that there isn't any given body weight that means you're actually healthy. So for example, I could put, I could tell you about two people, both of whom are five foot 10 both of whom weigh 280 pounds. One of them lives a very sedentary lifestyle, uh, spends most of their time in front of the television, uh, eats sweets and candies all day. And one of them is a professional athlete. They both uh, have the exact same. Yeah. Hi, Doc. 
uh, did you change the uh, slides? Actually, we are not getting the updated one. So I've got uh, uh, still on body weight. Yeah, so we are seeing the watts velocity lagging indicator. Lagging indicator for a complex system, and it's got a big scale on it, right? No, it's got an employment line queue. Unbelievable. Okay. And we see the speaker notes on the screen as well. Do you now? It's lagging indicator for complex system. And it's got a scale. Yes. And you see the speaker notes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. You guys are seeing my view, and I'm seeing and I'm seeing your view. This is in, inverted. I thought this was. Uh, that is definitely not what I want. I thought for sure that well, these were mirrored. That comes out clearly. So I didn't I, hear I, that. I, uh, yeah, so I request you to you know uh, change it uh, manually. So that would be great, I think. All right, let's try this. Okay. Okay, can you see the updates that I'm doing right now in terms of showing the navigation and all that? Yeah, looks good. Okay, all right, all right. So let's just let's just do it this way, and it's it. Just, hopefully, uh, you'll get to, it'll advance more. All right. So if we if we think about this, right? So we've got a lagging indicator for complex system. Body weight happens to be one of those things. Uh, we can clearly identify that uh, no particular body weight by itself indicates that an individual is healthy and we extrapolate that same, to same same thing to velocity we can conclude pretty easily that no given velocity indicates that a team is actually doing well or is actually healthy so now i want you to think about uh let's say for example you decided um that you want to lose oh 10 pounds Right, so you want to lose 10 pounds. What would you need to do? What what things could you do that would help you lose 10 pounds? So go ahead and type them in the, in, the, in the chat. Yep, I can see them this time. Right, okay, so exercise, eat fewer calories, diet, exercise, rest, balance diet, uh, health checkups gets a root cause, okay? Right, uh, so these and many other things are, are things that we could do, avoid sugary foods. There's lots of things that we could do that would actually help us to uh, to hit that weight target, to hit that goal. What else could we do? Could I, if I wanted to lose 10 pounds, could I, mm, I don't know, smoke crack? Could I cut my arm off at the forearm? Could I starve myself for a week? And of course, the answer is yes, I could. I could do any of those things and I could hit my target. I could hit my goal for my weight but I would not be improving my health. And with velocity, one of the things that happens quite often is teams are trying to, and I'm doing air quotes, improve their velocity and the things that they're doing achieve that end, but do not improve the health of the overall system. So we get what looks like better velocity or we get better velocity but we get lower quality or, you know, we miss targets or we um, aren't actually delivering what customers want, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, 
you know, it's multiple I issues with velocity as uh, a measure in terms of what it actually tells us and how we can actually, you know, beneficially use it. So I want to give an example here of kind of velocities in general. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm using the term velocities kind of uh, tongue in cheek, but a tale of two velocities, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, two teams and we're going to compare their velocity. Now, before we actually do that, I want to give you a disclaimer. In real life, I would never do this. I would never advocate for comparing the velocity of two teams against one another. Uh, what I would actually, uh, so what we're going to do for this is suspend some, some disbelief. We are going to compare the same team against itself in two different time dimensions, in two different realities a reality A and reality B, but we're comparing the same team against itself, uh, right? So at least let's go with that premise. So we start off. So here we have uh, this team in these two different time dimensions, one on the left, one on the right. And over the last four iterations, uh, these are the number of, let's call them points that they have actually delivered. And this team right now is using a technique for determining what will be our velocity in the next iteration? And what they're using is what we call yesterday's weather. This is a fairly common technique. Several of you have probably heard of this and maybe some of you have actually used it. With yesterday's weather, what we do is we take a look at our uh, velocity in the current iteration or the iteration that we just finished. And we assume that our velocity in the next iteration will probably be the same. So for this team in both of these dimensions, using yesterday's weather, we are guessing that their velocity in the next iteration will be 10 points. Right. Okay, that seems decent, uh, but a lot of folks have discovered that like, oh, that doesn't actually work super well. Um, it turns out that when we use yesterday's weather and we've got variable velocity like we do in dimension B on the right, our predictions are kind of off. So what do we do? Well, what, we, what teams then start to do is they use a rolling average. And a rolling average typically is, we're gonna look at the last three, four, maybe five iterations. In this case, we're gonna use the last three, which is what, uh, if you're familiar with the tool Pivotal Tracker, that's what it does for you when it's, it's calculating your velocity. So we're gonna use the last three iterations and we're gonna average those three together and that will give us a better prediction of what our velocity will actually be in the next iteration. Of course, if any one of you can do the math pretty quickly, when you use the last three measurements and you average them together, it turns out you still get 10. So in many cases, uh, the rolling average is still not a really great indicator of what our velocity is going to be. So I've seen teams now that have started moving in this new direction uh, and I don't, even, I don't even know if it's new. I've seen teams that have been doing this thing for a while where they start actually using standard deviation. So now with standard deviation, we start to actually uh, calculate in the variance in our overall velocity. Um, there's a fairly complex uh, way of calculating standard deviation. Uh, the easiest way is take uh, the, your uh, velocity history, dump it into Excel, highlight all of the numbers and tell Excel, give me a standard deviation and it will spit out a number. Um, but if you wanna know the formula, I've got it in the, uh, in the notes that are available afterwards. So now if we look at these two dimensions and we look at A and we look at B and we say, okay, what's the standard deviation uh, on A and what's the standard deviation on B, we see something happen here. Standard deviation on A is 0.7 and the standard deviation on B is 3.1, which means that there's a much wider variance uh, if we then apply the standard deviation to our rolling average, we end up with ranges. So we can look at it and say, oh, in dimension A, in the next iteration, we're probably going to have somewhere between 9.3 and 10.7 is our velocity. In dimension B, in this in next iteration, we're probably going to have somewhere between 6.9 and 13.1 as our standard, as our as our velocity. Now, this makes product managers. Uh, project managers, product owners, 
lots of people very nervous. They want an exact number, even when exactness is uh, pretty much a lie. Um, I started using this uh, years ago and we were actually creating graphs that looked like this. So here's your standard burn down and you can see um, kind of a line down the middle here, which is the usual calculation for burn down. Uh, and then this was with one standard deviation applied, you could then see the range. Uh, and this gives you like a 67% confidence interval. If you want a, a higher confidence interval, you apply two standard deviations. Uh, and what ends up happening, of course, is then you have the conversation of, hey, uh, we're probably gonna be done either uh, next Tuesday or never. Um, but it's at least an honest conversation, right? So the next thing that I see with teams is, um, and this really kind of doesn't come from the teams themselves, it usually comes from leadership, but is this idea of agile teams are gonna get faster. This need for speed uh, when it comes to velocity. Unfortunately, I think what's kind of happened is uh, you know, a lot of managers, a lot of leaders uh, with good intentions decide that they wanna install the agile um, they go read one of the books, uh, typically one of the more popular books, which means that it's about uh, Scrum uh, and it's probably hand wavy and it's probably full of, of vague promises. One of which is somewhere around the third or fifth iteration, the team's velocity will improve. Now, nowhere in these books does it say how it improves or why it improves. Uh, by what means does it improve? They just simply make the promise that if you do the scrum, velocity will improve. Uh, apparently it's just some kind of magic. Uh, and so unfortunately we end up with folks who are expecting that teams are going to get faster as they get better at the agile. Um, and we end up with, you know, leaders who are asking us to actually produce more velocity, uh, whether or not it's actually possible. Now, here's what happens. When we actually uh, start to pay attention to velocity like this and we start to uh, um, talk about it, especially from a leadership perspective, especially from the perspective of, hey, yeah, you know, more velocities might be good, uh, we invoke this thing that's called the Hawthorne effect. Now, how many of you, I guess I can't, you can't really answer this question very easily, um, but uh, Hawthorne effect, I think is fairly commonly known these days. Uh, I'm gonna tell a, a short story about it. Um, so effectively with Hawthorne effect, um, uh, a lighting company years ago, uh, the Hawthorne plant is where their first experiments were done. Um, and that's why it's called the Hawthorne effect. Uh, they were looking at uh, the effects of the environment uh, on workers and their productivity, their throughput. And um, so they, set, they got, got all the workers together and said, hey folks, we are looking at the effects of the environment on productivity throughput in the, on the factory floor. Uh, you will notice that we're gonna be making some changes around here. And uh, you know, we just wanna see what is the optimal environment uh, for work? And uh, being a lighting company, they started with the lighting. And so they said, all right, well, our, our, our premise is that if we increase the lighting, people will feel better uh, and productivity will go up. So they went ahead and they increased the lighting on the factory floor. And of course, productivity went up. Said, wow, this is fantastic. That's exactly what we thought. And what's really beneficial for us is as a lighting company, that means that we are going to sell more lights. And then someone said, well, hang on a second. This is supposed to be scientific. We had a hypothesis. We seem to have proved it. What else could we do? Said, All right, well, you stick in the mud. I guess we'll do something. Uh, we could lower the lighting. Let's lower the lighting to below what the original levels were. And let's see what that does to productivity. So they went ahead and they lowered the lighting to below what the original levels were. And guess what happened? Productivity went up. So then they're scratching their heads and they're going, well, this doesn't make any sense. We're not sure what's happening here. And they decided, you know what, let's just scrap the project. 
They scrapped the project, but they didn't tell the employees the project was scrapped. They set the lighting back to normal, and guess what happened? Productivity went up. Over the course of the next couple of months, it became known that the, that the study had ended, and eventually productivity returned to normal levels. So what is the Hawthorne effect? Well, the fundamental lesson here is that which is measured will improve. So they told employees they were measuring this stuff, and just by telling them they were measuring it, it actually started to improve. And it improved at specific signals, which employees knew when this changes in the environment, they're looking for impact to productivity. So that sounds all fantastic until you realize that there's got to be a cost. There's only a couple options here. One is that the people were working so suboptimally that they were actually able to improve productivity three times without any sacrifice. More likely what actually happened was uh, quality went down or they were fudging time. They were actually coming in a little bit earlier, staying a little bit later, maybe skipping lunches. Uh, maybe they were just a little bit more rushed, right? But somewhere in the system, something that we weren't measuring was actually, uh, you know, being sacrificed in exchange for uh, more stuff getting done. Now, the next thing that happens is, is uh, you know, typically we've got someone who says, hey, you know what, we could use a little bit more velocity, really appreciate it. And then eventually what happens is they look at it and they go, hey, team, you know, you're doing really great. Love it. Really appreciate all the effort. You know, I've, I've seen that, uh, you know, we're averaging about 18 points per iteration. That's awesome. You guys really kicking it. You know, we were only at 10 when we started, so I'm really proud of you for that. But I've done some math and I'm looking at the burn down and it turns out that we're not going to hit the target. We're not going to hit our date unless you guys can get to 22 points per iteration within like, oh, I don't know, the next iteration. So I really think we could do it. I really appreciate it. I really believe in you guys. I'm just asking you to, you know, put in a little bit more effort and let's see if we can get that 22 points per iteration. What do you say, team? Yeah. The thing that happens as soon as you do that, no matter how good your intents are, is you, you invoke Goodhart's law. Now, Goodhart's law uh, is similar in some ways to the Hawthorne effect but it's actually even more detrimental. So uh, this is named after Charles Goodhart. Uh, Goodhart was a chief economic advisor to the Bank of England. Uh, and in a 1975 paper where he's actually advising the bank about uh, economic policy and some things that they were doing in terms of actually setting targets, he said to them, hey, listen, uh, folks, I want you to be aware that there's uh, some risks here. Uh, verbatim, what he said was, any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. Any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. Now that's a little bit hard to understand, but it's actually super important. So paraphrasing what Goodhart was telling us was, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. His point fundamentally is when you take a trailing indicator, I don't know, say velocity or many of our economic indicators, and you set targets for them, what happens is you've changed the system. You have changed the environment that produces that output. And in doing so, the metric, the measurement, no longer means what it used to mean. And therefore, the target doesn't mean what you think it means. It's actually a bogus target. And typically, the end result is that you've got perverse incentives. Perverse incentives fundamentally are when we get uh, an unintended result that is actually contrary to the interests of the incentive makers. So we can see here the Dilbert dog uh, cartoon. And by the way, I'm just gonna check in because we've gone for quite a bit now. Are you guys seeing the slides update as we go along now? Looks good. 
Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So we can see here with Dilbert, with uh, Dilbert, with Dogbert, what ends up happening is, you know, he's on tech support, right? And what have they asked him to do? They've asked him to increase his average call time. They want it to improve, and improving for them is, we want your average call time to go down. So we can see that he basically tells him to shut up and reboot, and then he says, shut up and hang up. So he's rude. He's not providing real customer support. He's not really even providing real tech support. Uh, but hey, he's hitting that target, right? And so, you know, if, if they probably wanted average call times to decrease because they wanted to be able to handle more customers in a shorter period of time to result in happier customers, but this isn't going to result in happier customers. Now, how does this extrapolate to what we do? Well, I've seen this in a number of uh, environments. One of the things I've seen is when we reward for the number of bugs found. So we'll, we'll tell the uh, QA folks, which by the way, uh, just saying QA folks gives me the shivers because it means that something is seriously wrong. Um, but we're asking these folks, uh, hey, we need your help. We want more bugs found so that we can drive them out of the system. And what actually ends up happening is we end up with tons of bugs in the backlog, but they're actually duplicates. There's uh, there's significant, you know, insignificant nuances between them, but we want them all to be different bugs because uh, we're being incentivized to find more bugs. Uh, there's more arguments and discussions about, is it a missed feature? Is it a bug? What does this mean? How is this going? So what's actually happening then is we're spending more time on inconsequential quote unquote flaws in the software, less time on delivery of value, our attempt to make our customers more happy over a relatively short time horizon will actually make them less happy. Um, and you know, I've seen this with uh, rewards for code coverage, uh, clearly in rewards for high velocity. Um, almost any place I've seen where we're actually doing rewards for higher velocity, a couple of things happen right away. Uh, we end up with more brittle code, we end up with lower test coverage, and we end up with more escaped defects in production. But hey, we hit that velocity target, right? So these are all things we kind of want to watch out for. Now, I don't know if you know who this guy is, um, but uh, hopefully you do. Edward Stemming tells us, look, what matters is not setting the quantitative goals, but fix the methods by which the goals are attained. You know, get to the root cause. Don't look at the goals and set targets for them. Don't try and even fix the, the those, those, don't try and uh, look measures and set targets or goals for them. Fix the method by which the goals are attained. What is the underlying cause of these things? That's how you fix a system. That's actually how you improve your velocity is not looking at velocity, but looking at other things. So I want to show you, uh, I'm going to show you a chart here and I want to ask you a question. So this chart is a team's uh, velocity over time. So uh, the numbers along the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, those are uh, iterations. Uh, and then the uh, numbers on the y-axis is uh, the, their velocity per iteration. So I've got, a, I've got some questions for you. Um, uh, a question for you, what causes variable velocity? When you look at this chart, what types of things come to mind that might have caused this to happen? Resources changing, sure. So I'm assuming when you say resources changing, you mean staff. Um, uh, available manpower impediments. Yep, okay, so same kind of thing, right? Uh, requirements aren't clear, excellent. Uh, attrition, so uh, maybe staffing, right? Uh, a long running work items. Ah, different or iteration uh, lengths, uh, defects. Yep, members of the team leave. Uh, I don't know what BAU means. Uh, methods of estimation. Yep, large user stories, production bugs. Yeah, so these are all good things, right? Now, here's the thing. Do you know which one of them? by looking at this chart? And of course the answer is no. We can take a bunch of guesses, but we don't really know. So what did we talk about? We talked about a few different things that could cause variable velocity. Um, let me see, did we, did we touch this one? Uh, time poorly spent? Uh, maybe we didn't. Um, I see this quite a bit. It's kind of, you know, uh, a lot of administrivia, minutia. Um, 
people have to uh, record the exact hours that they put against every single card because we need to get better at this estimating thing. Um, uh, we're not sitting in a co-located team, therefore we've got uh, three meetings per day where we communicate stuff. Um, you know, just basically not using our time very well is, is, is one of the causes of, of highly variable velocity. Um, another cause, and I think this one was mentioned, was dependency on other teams. So our team's doing great, but it turns out that we can't actually launch until the database team, uh, you know, makes that schema change and their SLA for a schema change is six weeks. So please here, here we are in this iteration and we're done, but it's going to be two more iterations from now before the database team can actually make the schema change. So we can't go production to production for yet another two weeks after that. Right. So that's going to cause highly variable velocity unless we start measuring things like, well, development done is good enough for velocity. Um, right. One of the ones that I know was mentioned was uh, poor story composition. Uh, so, you know, the stories are too big. Uh, sizes, um, maybe different different ways of estimating, right? So these end up causing challenges for us when we've got, you know, one huge story that's coming through followed by a bunch of teeny tiny stories. We've got an iteration that's got basically zero velocity or one or two, and then all of a sudden this big story finally finishes, that's 15 points, and then like nine more small stories follow it. We've got 27 points for, you know, that particular iteration. Uh, and then the next one, another big story comes through and we kind of, you know, the same sort of thing, right? Uh, and of course, some people mention this, uh, bugs, defects, or messy code. Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, this can be one of the key contributors is it happens that in these iterations, we're spending time in some code base that's not so great. Uh, one that didn't come up and usually doesn't, but is very significant, is too much work in progress. So this is especially uh, common among uh, Scrum teams, and you know, I'm I'm trying not to be too hard on Scrum, uh, but you know, uh, offer me a beer sometime, and we can talk about it. Um, but oftentimes on Scrum teams, what I see happen is one, we're still operating with this idea of commitments per iteration, which most of the Scrum documentation from at least two of the three. Uh, kind of scrum bodies um, have pretty much eliminated that concept, yet somehow it permeates the, uh, the environments and culture. And what happens when we have these, this notion of commitments per iteration is we sit down and we say, well, our velocity needs to be 22, so we've loaded up 24 points just to make sure that we've got a little bit of stretch. Uh, then uh, who's going to work on what? Well, you know, you're going to work on this and she's going to work on that. And he's going to work on these other things and, you know, and she's going to work on yet these other things. Okay, team, we've got to get all this work done. Go. And what happens is uh, I pick up my story, one of my stories. I start working on it. I get blocked because I need information from someone on another team. And I go, well, I can't wait. So I pick up another story, start working on that. Uh, I'm, I'm a third of the way through that and the information on the first story comes back. So I switch over to that one. I start working on it. Uh, that gets blocked. I go look at the second story that I picked up and, uh, I'm not really feeling that one today. So I go ahead and pick up my third story that I'm supposed to do that gets started. Uh, but you know what, it's kind of low priority. And now the first one's unblocked again. So I go back to that and, oh, wait, I got to get the second one done. And, uh, oh, wait. Uh, uh, and we get to the end of the iteration and all of my stuff is, 60 to 70 to 80 percent complete but none of it's actually done and everyone on the team is following the same pattern we're working on all of the things at once and that actually has a huge impact on on throughput all right so we've talked about some stuff that actually causes variable velocity what can we do what are things that we can look at um so uh, I'm going to encourage you to take a look at scatter diagrams uh, scatter diagrams are a technique for uh, identifying kind of uh, correlations, which can which can maybe uh, help us identify root causes. Uh, so I'm going to show you these pretty quick and kind of how to use them. And I apologize, I realize the time is going quickly. So um, this scatter diagram is uh, I'm showing you a simple one to to begin with. This is auto prices by age. Um, we can see the age of the vehicle along uh, the x, x the x axis and the price of the vehicle along the y axis, uh, and 
I think we can see a fairly clear correlation here that goes uh, down and to the right. This is what we call a negative correlation. So the older the vehicle, so the higher the age of the vehicle, the lower the value or price of the vehicle. But I wanted to show you this because it's one that like we can all kind of understand pretty quickly and take a look at it, right? So let's take a look at this one. And these are actual simplified uh, scatter diagrams from prior projects, prior teams. This is velocity by complexity. Um, this, so we looked at uh, complexity being cyclomatic complexity, which is a measure of the number of branches in the code. Uh, and so uh, areas of the code that had higher complexity, um, what was basically the throughput in those areas of the code versus areas of the code that had lower complexity. Um, as you can imagine, there is pretty much a correlation here. Uh, the lower complexity, the more throughput we had or the more velocity we had. So this is again, a negative correlation Higher complexity means lower volume. Complexity is a objective measure of the internal quality of the code. I have plenty of developers who will argue that if statements are not, uh, are not a big deal, what's the problem here? Case statements aren't a big deal, switch statements aren't a big deal, but it turns out there is a direct positive correlation between cyclomatic complexity and escaped defects. The more complex your code in terms of logic branches, the more defects it has, period. Uh, all right, the next one. So this one I thought was interesting. This is a team, uh, velocity by value. And in this case, if we take a look at it, there is no correlation. We can see that the dots are kind of all over the place. There's no clear line. Um, and the question for this team was, should there be? And the answer for them was, yes, there should be. Why is that? they were agreeing that the highest value items, and by the way, for this team, the way that they assessed value was the product owner actually had a, if we release this feature, we believe we will generate X thousand dollars in revenue over the course of the next so many months. So they had a heuristic for value that was tied to what they believed was going to be uh, revenue generated. So their backlog was prioritized primarily by value. If you're always pulling the highest value items first, then there should be a correlation, a positive correlation between value and velocity. In this case, there was not. And what they found out was that many of the high value stories were not well understood. They were not well decomposed. Uh, developers could not work on them. Um, they got uh, they got delayed, et cetera. And many of the lower value stories were actually easier to work on and it created this funky diagram. So it resulted in a much better conversation for them about how we prioritize our work and how we actually execute our work. All right, next one. Uh, this one is counterintuitive for many people. This was done across multiple teams over a long period of time, each of them having their own, own sets of graphs. And then this is just kind of an aggregate of that. This is velocity by code coverage. This is uh, the uh, bottom, our X is percentage of, of code coverage, and our Y, again, is velocity. Uh, you'll see this is a positive correlation, which means, and code coverage, if you don't know what that means, it is the amount of code that is covered by automated tests, which means the team is taking the time to write tests. So how is it if you are taking more time to write the tests, you are also getting higher velocity. That seems counterintuitive. But what we found was that teams that tested automated testing, especially teams that tested first, were writing code that was one, more testable. It turns out the code that is more testable is decoupled, is uh, has higher cohesion, is overall better organized, which means it's more readily maintainable. And it turns out that most work is actually modifying or changing code, adding some functionality to existing pieces, than it is writing brand new stuff. So over a relatively short period of time, we see that teams that write automated tests actually have higher velocity than teams that don't. All right, one more. 
uh, as far as scatter diagrams go, just giving an example. Um, this is lead time by uh, story size. Um, and so what we found was, uh, so the, the bottom is story size. Um, you can see that they are, they fall pretty clearly on a Fibonacci scale, one, two, three, five, eight, and 13. Um, and you can see that the larger the story, the longer it takes to deliver. That makes sense, it's a positive correlation. One of the things that we noticed in this as we kind of started breaking this down was here we have a 13 point story that takes uh, about 27 uh, uh, days or, or you know, whatever this measurement was, right? I don't remember, um, but, but um, uh, yeah, it takes about 27 days because it's lead time, not velocity. Uh, and then here we have stories that are, you know, uh, five and, you know, one, two, and three. So if you could take that 13 and you could break it into two fives and a three, you would have what? 15, uh, let's call that a six, 21 days. It would take 21 days to get those same stories through as opposed to 27 or even here 24. What we found was decomposing these large stories into smaller thin slices even when they broke down, the 13 point story became a 14 or a 15 point story. It still moved through the system faster. Uh, you know, it, uh, it aggregated 15 points. It still moved through the system faster than it did as a large story. So this helped the team see the value of actually decomposing their stories. Now we've talked about scatter diagrams and their benefits and kind of how we can use those to see uh, maybe some root causes and figure out what's going on. But I want to tell you a quick story, uh, Friedman's thermostat. Uh, this is just about scatter diagrams in general and correlation in general. So uh, Milton Friedman was an economic advisor to the present, uh, to President Ronald Reagan in the 80s. Um, and he told this story as uh, an, an, an allegory, an analogy for, um, uh, you know, be careful when you're looking at correlations. So the story that he tells, uh, and I'll tell it pretty quickly here, is basically um, imagine that you live in a um, you live in a town uh, that uh, has never seen uh, a heating unit, an air conditioning unit, or a thermostat. You you folks live in uh, you know underground dwellings or whatever it might be, um, and you've never seen these devices. And you hear of this. And by the way, the summers are terrible and the winters are terrible, uh, but then spring and fall are okay. Uh, and you hear of these people in a far off land who have this ability to somehow uh, always stay comfortable. So you send an agent out to go study what's going on in that environment, in that community. And they do a bunch of studies and they realize that, hey, there's a few different factors uh, that are, are involved here. Um, there's the outside temperature, uh, there's the inside temperature of the home, and it turns out that there's this thing, uh, fuel oil, and uh, fuel oil seems to be getting burned for some reason. So as, I, as, as, as your, your scout has studied the system, they come back and they report, listen, I don't think this is going to work for us, and here's why. It turns out that as the outside temperature increases, the home temperature stays the same. So there seems to be no kind of connection there. If the outside temperature decreases, the home temperature stays roughly the same. So there seems to be no real connection there. The connection that I found was the more fuel oil they burn, the colder it gets outside. Now, the lesson here is that correlation is not always an indication of causation, but it's a hint. You have to understand the system well enough to be able to actually draw conclusions from correlations. If you don't understand the system, you can draw ridiculous conclusions. All right, so what else can we do? Uh, correlations, very good. Um, understanding that, you know, what you see as a pattern may not be informative, but probably is. Uh, one of my favorite tools, metrics, uh, or measurements that we can use is cumulative flow diagram. Cumulative flow diagram, here's how we do it. Um, I don't care what your backlog, what the contents of the backlog is. What's important here is that this team has a backlog that shows ready to start, in progress, in testing, ready for approval, and deployed. What you do is on a daily basis, you uh, 
accumulate whatever the totals are in each of those columns and you throw them into a spreadsheet. You then run a stacked area graph against that spreadsheet and you get something that looks something like this. Uh, it will look like this without all of the arrows, but I want you to see these arrows. Let's see if we can zoom in. Yep, okay. So a cumulative flow diagram tells you a ton of stuff in a single view. It tells you uh, your cycle time, uh, which is basically from the time that development picks it up to the time that it's ready for review. Your lead time, the time from, hey, wouldn't it be nice if, to the, to the hey, ain't that nice. Um, you can see the backlog size, so you can also ski, see if the scope is increasing. You can see the remaining work that's to be done. You can see the actual work that is in progress at any given time. So this gives you a bunch of different measures and metrics, work in progress, lead time, cycle time, uh, scope growth, uh, remaining work to be done, all in one nice kind of clean, very simple view. Now, what's really beneficial with this thing is it's actually informative versus other charts. So here is a velocity chart. We saw this before. I asked you what caused the variance in this velocity. We had a bunch of hypotheses, uh, but we couldn't prove any of them. The one thing that we do know about this team is that their velocity is in fact increasing over time. So I guess that's okay. The scrum book was right, but we still can't really predict, right? So let's take a look at this exact same team, this exact same data from a different perspective. We're gonna take the exact same data and we're gonna dump it into a cumulative flow diagram. Here's their cumulative flow diagram. Now, when we look at this, you notice a few things. In progress, which means it's, it's basically in development and in testing are these thin little lines that typically means there's not a whole lot of stuff that's moving through those at any given time. This ready for approval is getting really large and then collapsing and then getting really large and collapsing. And there is a correlation somehow between when the ready for approval collapses, also there's a scope increase. So the challenge with this team was hey, we're just not getting stuff done fast enough, meaning it's not getting into production fast enough. And the ask was, can you please make the devs and testers go faster? But by putting together a cumulative flow diagram, we were able to very quickly prove it's not your devs, it's not your testers, it's something about approval. And it turns out that their product owner was a traveling salesperson and that individual would be on the road for long periods of time and not able to actually review and approve stuff, would get into the office, would run through a bunch of approvals real quick, and then would also say, hey, by the way, while I was on the road, I learned some things, here's new work that needs to be done. This visual made it very obvious where the actual problem was, no need for you know uh, finger pointing or anything else, just these are the facts. Um, we could have a discussion about a proxy product owner who could do review use more often and smooth these lines out. That's exactly what they did. Uh, and they reduced their lead time pretty significantly by doing so. All right, so I've gone through a lot of stuff and I know we're almost out of time here and I wanna be respectful of that. So let's just cover the last piece. What I want you to do as you look at your environments, I want you to measure many things. I don't want you to just measure one. Uh, I encourage you to maybe even set velocity aside and look at lead time, cycle time and, and some of the other stuff that we talked about. Uh, Here's a team, here's their velocity chart. Uh, I will change it to an area graph, but it's the same basic chart that we've been looking at. Again, we can't really see, we can't really tell a story of what's going on. We know that their velocity went up and then it went down, but we're not sure really why. So how could we figure that out? Well, what if we also measured the code quality? This starts to tell us a story. We can see that the code quality starts to take a dip as velocity goes up and eventually both seem to kind of recover uh, depending on if you consider the velocity of recovery or not. That tells us a bit of the story, but not all of it. What else? Well, it turns out that these folks uh, were um, a software development company that did custom software development. So they measured, they, they tracked all of their hours. Uh, and hours, by the way, is on the right hand uh, axis, just so you don't think they're working 12 hours a week. Um, and we can see that their average hours is increasing, in fact, as their, as their velocity starts to take a dip, their average hours are still staying very high, right? So we're starting to get a better story here. And then one more thing that we measured for them was team joy. We, we actually had a technique that we used for um, a couple of times a day, asking them how they were feeling. Uh, and we uh, tracked that. And we can see the joy taking a dip, and then we can see joy kind of rising again. 
And if we look at this, joy takes a dip slightly before quality starts to take a dip, joy rises before quality starts to rise. Um, one of the things that we actually noticed was that the team joy was a bit of a leading indicator against other challenges, other problems. So if we paid attention to that and were good about how we addressed it, not what's wrong with you people, why are you not happy? But actually inquiring about, hey, we see that there's some, some angst, there's some complications, what's happening? How can we help you fix that? Uh, we were able to, to more, more readily address these issues. Uh, and this basically was the team felt pressure to deliver, so quality was suffering. Because quality was suffering, it was harder to deliver, and it just became a vicious cycle until finally they, they had some conversations and said, you know what, we gotta do something different. They started refocusing on quality as well as delivery, um, you know, and things kind of recovered. Uh, I'm going to skip real world examples. I'm just going to go through these really quick. Standard velocity with uh, velocity standard deviation. I showed you a variant on that before. Here's the burn down with standard deviation that we've done in other environments. Uh, here's an actual cumulative flow from a team that I worked with. Um, this is a distribution chart. This actually shows lead times. So uh, for, again, from kind of the moment from, hey, wouldn't it be nice if, to hey, isn't it nice? How long did it take to get a thing done? Uh, I believe this is actually in uh, days, um, and we can kind of see that the distribution chart has a long tail to the right. Um, that makes sense because uh, we could never deliver anything in less than zero days, but we can but can always take longer than average to deliver something. If you think about your commute home, most days, let's say it's 20 minutes, um, it's possible you could do it in 19, maybe 17 maybe on a good day in 15, but you could never do it in five. Um, but your commute home, if it averages 20 minutes, could take an hour on a really bad day. So that's why these, these are, are you know, skewed to the right. Um, I'm gonna pop through these pretty quickly. Unfortunately, the technical issues kind of, kind of caused this for us. Uh, but what you, can, what you can use this for, and what I'm showing here, is this is a confidence interval. It's, a, it's an actual distribution. Um, same distribution chart we're looking at, but but now if someone asks us, hey, uh, how long is that story going to take? We can ask them, uh, how confident do you want the estimate to be? If they say, ah, oh, you know, I'd say like 50% confident, which by the way is equivalent to a coin flip. So they may say that, but they don't actually want it. You can say, oh, well, we could probably get it done in about six days. If they say, no, 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 I want 100% confidence. Great. Then 16 days. Well, that sounds like it's ridiculous. That's way too long, right? But you asked me for a 100% confidence interval and the longest it's ever taken us to do a story is 16 days. Therefore, 16 days is 100% confidence. Um, and this actually shows, so the orange box is a standard deviation applied against a rolling velocity. Remember that technique that we used previously? Because velocity and lead time actually have a long tail, two standard deviations is normally 95% confidence, but it turns out that standard deviation against a rolling average is not mathematically correct on a chart like this. This is our 95% confidence interval at about 13 and a half days, not 11 and a half days. Um, so it's, I encourage the use of, of this technique. And again, there's more stuff in the, um, uh, in the, in the notes. Uh, team joy, we talked about measuring that. We also in that same environment measured department joy um, and how they were doing on autonomy, connection, excellence, and diversity should be on this graph, but is apparently not there. Um, so, all right, so we're right, we're, we're over time. One last thing that I want you guys to know, uh, metrics are not for managers, metrics are for teams. This information is for the team to be able to make informed decisions about how they're working and how they want to change their work. We make the mistake of thinking that metrics are for managers to govern the team. Then we end up with all of these issues in terms of Hawthorne effect, Goodhart's law, uh, perverse incentives, right? It is when the team is being informed and is making decisions that metrics become positive and healthy. Now, that's a fairly general statement. There are metrics that are good for managers to use, but the stuff that we've talked about today, I think are primarily uh, for the teams. Um, all right, 
If you want more information, which includes all of the slides um, and all of the research and information about how to make these the charts and do this stuff, send a blank email to CTO2 at sendyourslides.com with the subject line Agile Metrics. It's all one word. Um, it's an autoresponder and we'll give you the information. Uh, with that, I want to kind of wrap it up. And if we've got time for Q&A, that would be great. If not, I totally understand. So I think, uh, hey, thank you so much, uh, Doc. And I request all the participants, if you have any question, please ask. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Yeah, um, so so thank you so much, Doc, for a wonderful session. I, and, I, and I hope uh, all the participants will get joined. And I hope that this uh, you know interactive session will be very, very helpful for all the participants. And thank you so much again. And thank you so much to all the participants for joining us today. Thanks again. All right, thanks, folks. Have a great day. All right, take care.